Open, if you would, please, to Ephesians 5. We sure are glad that you guys are here today. Hope that you guys have had a good week. It is really good to be back and um, to just be able to hang out with you guys again. We've missed you guys. We are in this month, uh, the month of June, we're doing a relationship series. And last week we started with marriage. We're going to continue with marriage today. Uh, talk a little bit more about that. And then uh, next week we're going to talk about parent-child relationships. And the week after we'll talk kind of uh, about relationships in general. But all of this is coming from Ephesians 5. And so if you're in Ephesians 5, uh, pick up with me in verse 21. You should submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And this next part's going to talk about marriage, so you're going to think that that's talking about marriage, but it's actually talking just about people of faith. People of faith should submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he would present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she would be holy and without blame. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, for whoever loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of Christ's body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and yet I'm saying that it speaks of Christ and the church. We talked a lot last week about how the marriage relationship is really a picture of, in the Old Testament, it's a picture of God and his people Israel, and in the New Testament, it's a picture of Christ and the church. And and so here's what we have on tap this week. A continuation of that and really uh, a restatement of what we had last week. So our theology this week is our marriages illustrate the relationship between Christ and the church. Our marriages illustrate the relationship between Christ and the church. Our application this week is this. Embrace the opportunity to have your marriage proclaim Jesus. Embrace the opportunity to have your marriage proclaim Jesus. And our prayer this week is, God, let our marriages rightly tell the redemption story. Let our marriages rightly tell the redemption story. We talked a little bit last week, or in fact, almost all of last week, we, we stayed on the theology aspect of it. And one of the things that I pointed out that I want to point out here again is this section talking about wives submitting to their husbands and husbands loving their wives concludes with, this is a profound mystery, but I'm actually saying it refers to Christ and the church. Marriage is a temporary construct. Uh, Our marriages will come to an end either when one of us dies or when Christ returns. But in heaven, the Bible says in Matthew that we are neither married nor given in marriage in heaven. Uh, You don't You don't get to have like parental status or marriage status in heaven. You don't get to continue in that kind of relationship. It's different. We don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but the Bible says that when we die, we get our new bodies, that we are likened unto angels. Uh, I, I want to make very, very clear, we are not angels. We do not become angels. All right, we are different than angels. We are a higher creation than the angels are. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 6 that we will judge the angels. And so, so don't, don't make that mistake of thinking that when the Bible says that we will become, our bodies become like the angels, that, that means we become angels. It's just a spiritual body. Something is different about us. And so Ephesians 5, this, this, it's, the, it's the longest New Testament text about marriage. Uh, Which And it's it's still only like, you know, 11 verses long. But it's the longest New Testament text about marriage. And it still indicates that earthly marriage is really about portraying Christ in the church. And so that's what we want to talk about today. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 6, here's the scenario that's happening. In 1 Corinthians 5, uh, a man and his father are sharing a wife, which... I know, right? That should be offensive to us. It was very offensive to Paul. Uh, That should be awkward, okay? So uh, I just want you to know that if any of you are considering that as a lifestyle choice, don't, all right? The Bible would condemn that, all right? And and so uh, a father and son are sharing a wife, and Paul is like, are you kidding me? Like, pagans don't even do this. There's a wickedness among you that even pagans don't do. 
And, uh, and one of the things that he says in 1 Corinthians 6 is this. He says, don't you know that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one flesh with her? And he said, in the same way, if you've joined yourself to Christ, you've become one spirit with Christ. And, and so it's interesting because what Paul's talking about is those of us who have joined ourselves with Christ, those who have put faith in Jesus, have become one spirit with Christ. We, we're, we're intermingled with Christ. Like Christ is in us and rules us and we live for him and like that can't be broken. And so there's this idea uh, we hear a lot of this similar kind of language in marriage vows, right? That the two become one. Uh, that's from Genesis chapter 24. Sorry, Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 24. It's quoted in Ephesians 5. It's quoted in 1 Corinthians 6. And we, we use the symbolism of the ring, and people say it's an endless circle or an endless loop to talk about this relationship and all this kind of stuff. And so marriage relationships are supposed to, in fact, marriage relationships do Tell the story of Jesus and the church. And if your marriage, I said this last week, if your marriage is really cruddy, then your marriage is doing a poor job of telling the story of Jesus. And if your marriage is good and right biblically, not good and right culturally, uh, then your marriage is correctly telling the story of Jesus. Now, why do I make that distinction? Because when I say if your marriage is good, biblically, not culturally, um, I have found, and I'm sure you found this too, that that people tend to view marriage as good kind of based on their own loose standards. And so if the home you grew up in was abusive, alcoholic parent maybe, a lot of adultery, that kind of stuff, and your marriage isn't marked by adultery and physical abuse and all that, then you go, our marriage is good, right? By comparison, we go, oh, it's not as bad as my parents' marriage was, therefore my marriage is good. Does that make sense? And yet, that's not the aim. The aim isn't to show the world that we have done better than our parents. The aim is to show the world that we represent Jesus. The, the aim is that our marriages would correctly tell the story of Jesus. And so I told you last week, we spent 25 of our 30 minutes last week on the theology. Um, and this week, we're going to flip it and spend 25 minutes on the application side. I, I want to give you some practical thoughts on what it looks like to have a marriage that proclaims Jesus. So the theology is our marriages illustrate the relationship between Christ and the church. Uh, if you need more information on that, go listen to our sermon from last week. Or come Wednesday night and we can talk more about what that means. Uh, we talked about that uh, a little bit this past Wednesday, but we can talk about it in more detail this week. The application is this. Embrace the opportunity to have your marriage proclaim Jesus. That's our application today. Embrace the opportunity to have your marriage proclaim Jesus. So it's, it's not, I don't, I don't know how to say this more plainly. I'm sure there's a really clear way to say this. Your marriage, as, as believers, your marriage is proclaiming Jesus. It's just doing a good job or a bad job of that. Okay? Is that does that make sense? You don't get to choose as a Christian whether or not your marriage is about Jesus. You don't really get to choose that. It is. You're, I, but either you've recognized that and you're taking steps to make it represent Jesus well, or you're not doing a very good job on that. And so let's just talk about this a couple of things. Like, I, I, I want, uh, uh, it's interesting. Um, There's a, a little verse in um, Song of Solomon that says, catch for us the little foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyard. It's talking about marriage. And it is interesting that it is oftentimes not things like adultery that undo marriage. It's little things. It's little petty things and differences. And so one of the things that I want to point out is this. Pretend for a moment uh, that you and your spouse have regular disagreements. And hopefully that's not the case. But if you and your spouse have regular disagreements, the likelihood is they are not about things that pertain to Jesus, right? Does that make sense? It's usually not about things that pertain to Jesus. It's about the gas tank being empty or clothes being left on the floor or um, the house not being picked up or this thing that one person asked the other one to do last week that still hasn't gotten done. It's usually about those kinds of things, right? Does that make sense? So typically the disagreements are about things that do not pertain to Christ. 
And if our only goal, if our only goal is to have our marriage proclaim Jesus, then we have to start asking ourselves these questions. We have to start asking ourselves, do, do dirty clothes on the floor, um, that's, I mean, like, I, th- I think I've said this to you guys before. I think we have, I know we have two. We might have three laundry baskets in the house. Uh, there's one on the boys' side of the house, and there's two, I think, in our laundry room, which is just outside of our bedroom. But my dirty clothes usually end up in a pile by the, by the closet um, because that's where I take them off <laughs> to get in my pajamas, you know, or whatever. And so that's where they normally end up. And, uh, and, and so uh, Michelle, I, I suppose, could yell at me about that. She doesn't, and I appreciate that grace. But the reason that she, the reason that she doesn't yell at me about that is because we decided before we ever embarked on marriage that our marriage wouldn't be about petty things. It could only be about Jesus. And, and while, while those things, listen, it, when we're talking about disagreements, we're typically talking about preferences, aren't we? How we prefer that something be done. Um, I have a way that I like to do it. You have a way that you like to do it. And what we typically want is the other person to compromise to our side of things. But if we switch our perspective to say, my only aim is to have Jesus proclaimed, then the dirty clothes on the floor or dirty dishes in the sink or uh, whatever the situation is, right? Uh, The car being wrecked. um, We can talk more about that next week when we talk about parents and kids, you know, trusting your soon to be driving kid to not wreck the car or whatever. But what, what, we really, what we really need to do is remember that this is about Jesus, that we're trying to proclaim Jesus. And so if that's the goal, let's just think about it for a minute. If I leave a pile of dirty clothes on the floor and Michelle's saying, man, I want our marriage to be about Jesus, then the reason she's not getting mad at me is because nothing that I do in leaving dirty clothes on the floor misrepresents Jesus. Does that make sense? It doesn't change anything about the cross. Jesus still died on the cross. Our sins are still forgiven. He was still raised from the dead. Does that make a little bit of sense? Like dirty clothes on the floor do not undo salvation. Can everybody agree with that? Yes, dirty clothes on the floor don't undo salvation. And so they shouldn't undo our marriage, right? But what what we need to do is hold who Christ is and salvation as the higher priority in our marriage. And if the dirty clothes on the floor don't undo the marriage, then they can't, sorry, if they don't undo my my relationship with Christ, they can't undo the marriage. Now, let's flip it though. And what attitude should I have? The attitude that I should have is that Christ came to be a servant, right? And Christ served the church, died for the church. So if I'm trying to best represent Jesus in the marriage, then what should I do with the dirty clothes? It's okay. Okay. I should pick them up, right? Because that's a way that I can serve my wife. So then it becomes not, it becomes not about, well, I'm doing this so my wife won't yell at me. It, comes, it becomes about Christ serves me and I want to be like Christ in the marriage. Does that make sense? So picking up the clothes or not picking up the clothes isn't a Jesus issue. Uh, sorry, it's not, it, it can't be a personal issue. It has to be a Jesus issue. We have to make it about The wife has to be able to say of the husband, you know, look, you're not undoing Jesus with that, so I'm not going to make a big deal about it. But at the same time, the husband has to say, Christ is a servant, and I want to be a servant like Christ. And yet, are there going to be days that the dirty clothes end up on a pile, in a pile on the floor? Sure. And should those things cause disagreements? No. Uh, There's, I I don't know how how to say this, like, I mean, I feel like this is incredibly painfully obvious. We all have preferences. Everybody has different preferences. We have preferences for what we want to eat, and we have preferences for the kind of food we enjoy and the shows we watch and the music we listen to. We have preferences for how we want to do life and save money or spend money. All of us have preferences, and the idea that two people would get married and have identical preferences is like a unicorn, you know, like it's... uh, uh, a unicorn with two horns. It's not going to happen. And so uh, I, I'm, that wouldn't make sense, right? Because then, it was, then it's a goat and, uh, or something. And so uh, uni means one. And so uh, uh, anyway, the, the point being that uh, 
we, what we, what we have done as Christians is premarital counseling looks a lot like this. Look, here's how you think. And here's how you think both of you just need to compromise. Both of you just need to give up some stuff. Both of you just need to be willing to kind of just go, all right, this isn't a fight I'm going to have. And that's what we teach people. We teach people compromise when what we should be teaching married couples is, look, both of you are different, but both of you have as the aim of your life, Jesus. So make your aim, Jesus. Does that make a little bit of sense? Like that your aim should be Jesus? Uh, I, uh, I, I, am, I am a clutter person. I have like piles of stuff. I, I just, I'm just not very well organized. I'm organized in like one area of my life. It's the most visible area of my life. So everybody thinks I'm organized. I am just not. Um, and, uh, and I, stuff just gets stacked up. Um, all the bills and all the mail and everything kind of gets, we do have a, pi- a pile place for that now. Uh, and, but there's, it's still a pile, you know, and then I have a pile of books or stuff next to my chair in the living room. It's not there when you come over on Wednesday night because we've moved it and I've thrown it on my side of the bed. But as soon as small group is over, it goes back to the table. Uh, and then there's a pile of stuff on the table. And then there's another pile of stuff by the refrigerator, all mine. Uh, and then by my bed, there's a pile of stuff. And then behind our closet door, there's another box that I still haven't unpacked from when we moved in in October. This is me. This is who I am. And my wife still loves me. Uh, and you could imagine, right, that those are, like, I, please tell me that you understand that a lot of people fight about petty things. Can we just agree that that's true? A lot of marriages are, are disrupted over petty things like a box behind the closet door. And, and yet, it's one of those things that the reason that we're able to keep harmony in our marriage is because the one aim that we have is to make much of Jesus. And the box behind the closet door neither uh, neither magnifies Jesus nor diminishes Jesus. Does that make sense? Uh, I'll never forget that Michelle came to me, and I, I couldn't tell you when it was, but the boys were pretty young. We had both of the kids at that point, and it was probably it was maybe, like, maybe like seven years ago. And Michelle came to me one day, and she was, and if you've watched our podcast on marriage, uh, then, um, then you, you've heard this already, but uh, Michelle came to me one day and she was kind of teary eyed. And, and I was like, what's wrong? And she was like, I didn't do the laundry this week. The sink's full of dishes. I had been doing, uh, retreats and camps and stuff still. So I'd been busy a lot. I was gone a lot. And she said, I haven't done the dishes. The laundry's not done. And she said, I haven't, uh, put the sheets on the bed yet. And she was like, I'm just a terrible, I'm just a terrible wife and mother. I was like, because there's dirty clothes and dirty dishes. I was like, we're not going to run out of underwear. And if we do, I know where Walmart is, you know, like, I mean, <laughs> like it, it'll be okay. Uh, for the first few years of our marriage, I, I did my own laundry. Um, I had done my own laundry before that. So I continue to do my own laundry. I, I'm not good at laundry. Um, I know you're supposed to sort it, but I think that's a myth. Um, so what I would do is just grab everything off the top of the pile and just throw it in, you know, and, and, and that's fine if you do that with, you know, like underwear and socks. It turns out it shrinks some of your shirts if you don't pay attention to the dryer setting and stuff. And so at some point in the mix, like Michelle just started doing mine as well. Um, we just kind of have some things that we've defaulted to. And there are things that she does and there are things that I do and there are things that we both do. But this particular day, she felt like she wasn't doing her job or whatever it was, right? And for those of you who are listening to this, I used quote fingers in a sarcastic eye roll for her job. And so she, she just felt bad. And I, and I asked her these questions. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, do you know Jesus? And she said, yes. I said, do you love Jesus? She said, yes. I said, did you spend some time in the word today? She goes, yes. Um, and I said, what have you been doing for the last hour and a half? And she goes, playing Legos with the boys. I said, right. And I said, in tonight's date night, isn't it? And she goes, yeah. I said, are you going to go on a date with me? And she goes, yeah. I said, then it sounds like you're knocking it out of the park, right? Like you're investing in your relationship with Christ. You're investing in, your, in the boys and you're investing in me. Like the dishes will get done. They do every time. And sometimes I do them and sometimes Michelle does them. Most of the time, Michelle does them. Um, I do most of the cooking at the house. I like to cook. She doesn't. And, and so I make the mess and she cleans it up. And that is a really good system for us. Uh, but it's funny because every now and then when I do the dishes, she'll be like, oh, thanks for doing that for me. And it's not even a for her because 
why? Why? Because my aim is, here's an opportunity that I have to serve my wife. I have some time. I have the ability. I'm serving my wife like Christ serves the church. And, and so, anyway, I just reminded her that day that, that being a good wife isn't about whether you cook or whether the dishes are clean or whether the laundry's done. Like, she loves the Lord. She loves her boys. She loves me. Like, that matters more, right? Does that make sense? And, and so, trying to make it trying to understand that our marriages don't stand or fall based on, uh, based on preferences or based on housework or chores, those kinds of things. Our marriages don't stand or fall on those things. Uh, you guys will be married at some point in the not too near or not too far future, right? And mar- your marriage will not survive because you mow the lawn and keep it really clean and you cook great, you know, chicken and rice dinners and, and you know, that's not what's going to make it survive. What's going to make it survive is that you guys agree that you want to make much of Jesus. Okay? Does it make sense? It, it's, it's about Christ. It has to be. It has to be about Christ. And so what we've got to be able to do, uh, I remember Riker was our pickiest eater growing up when he was really little. He was a really picky eater. And and I, I remember one time uh, when we used to do church just on Sunday nights, and uh, and he he hadn't eaten before church, and so after church he gets home and and Michelle's like it's too late to eat, you got to go to bed, and we talked about that later when I got home because uh, we were packing up, we still had to set up and tear down every week, and uh, and she said I, I told him and I just sent him to bed without dinner, and I was like well you know next time like it's okay like. I don't always feel like eating at dinner time. And then Michelle immediately like started crying. Oh my goodness, I sent my baby to bed hungry. I can't believe it. She felt so bad. And, and I was like, babe, it's okay. Like he's not going to starve to death. <laughs> you know, he'll be fine. And, uh, and, and it's interesting how we, uh, our view of self and therefore our view of our spouses and marriage is performance-based and not Jesus-based, Right? So here's the question. Your, your spouse has, or let me just make a statement instead. Your spouse absolutely has different preferences than you, at least on something. But if you're looking at your spouse and you know that they know Jesus, you know that. You know that they're in Christ. Then the question has to be, does Christ love your spouse? What's the answer to that? Yes, Christ loves your spouse. Did Christ die for your spouse? Yes, yes. Is your spouse loved and forgiven by God? Forgiven. Listen to this. We, we like to hold grudges um, as people. It's ridiculous. Uh, it doesn't benefit us at all. Uh, we, Bible, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 that love keeps no record of wrongs, and yet the human heart loves to keep records of wrongs. Uh, we have conversations with people outside of marriage for just a moment. Think about it like this. We have, we have friends who are going, man, I wouldn't ever forgive them if I were you, or I can't believe they did that to you. You should, you should be mad. Those are the kinds of things we say to each other. You should be angry. Man, that would make me mad too. You have every right to be mad. I, I would like to remind you, okay? I'd like it to be a reminder to us that no one can ever sin more against us than we have against God. Like wicked men nailed God to a cross. There isn't any greater sin than that. There isn't any greater offense than that, that wicked men would nail righteous God to a cross, and yet what was Christ's response from the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. No one can ever be more offensive than wicked men nailing righteous God to the cross, and yet he forgave them. We don't, get, we don't have the right in our marriages to hold grudges. We don't have the right in our marriages to be unforgiving. Because if you truly believe that God loves your spouse and that they are forgiven by God, you're not greater than God. You don't get to hold someone as unforgiven where Christ has forgiven them. And by the way, if you're in here today and you're married to a spouse who doesn't know Jesus, they're not a Christian, I want you to understand that God's only aim for them is that they would know him. So you don't even get to still be angry over it because you have to have the same aim for them that Christ does. So either you're viewing your Christian spouse as forgiven and loved by God, which is how you're supposed to view them, or you're viewing your non-Christian spouse as someone that Jesus died for, that he wants them to know him. Does that make sense? We don't get to harbor grudges. We don't get to harbor unforgiveness towards our spouse. And, and, People will say, okay, Ryan, but what if we're not talking just about dirty dishes? What if we're not talking about laundry or 
piles of crud all over the corner and your side of the bed. And what if if we're not talking about things that are like that? What if we're talking about adultery? What if we're talking about, um, you know, like things that have been really hurtful or things that a a drug abuse or alcohol abuse? Listen, um, you might need more help to navigate those things, but... Romans 8.1, speaking of those who are in Christ, says there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and if God holds us uncondemned, if God holds us as not guilty, then how do we hold our spouses as guilty? How, how do we get to make that judgment call? I, I'm not saying that, that your heart won't be broken. I'm not saying that you won't be wounded. But I'm saying that what we have to do is we have to be able to view our spouses through the same lens that Christ does. We have to. By the way, the Bible, uh, because the Bible uses marriage as a picture of a relationship with God, the Bible calls sin against God adultery. Did you know that? The Bible, because, because the Bible chooses to use marriage as a picture of God's relationship with his people, when, when God's people sin against him, they use adultery as a picture of sin against God. And what does God do when his people sin against him? What does God do when they commit adultery? He forgives them and he brings them back. I, I, I know that Micah feels this way. I know that Pierce feels this way. Uh, there, there isn't any, any problem, any hurt, any wound in marriage that cannot be overcome by the grace of God. There isn't. The grace of God can, can I, I'm not gonna, I don't want to say smooth over, the grace of God can eradicate any wound, any, any pain, any sin in marriage and make it whole. It can. The problem is that what we tend to do, um, Michelle and I have been together for 14 years now. That's shorter than most of you, longer than a couple of you. Uh, What we tend to do is we tend to view marriage from the perspective, like, and I've mentioned this before. I'll mention it now again, I suppose, that like the Facebook post of the, it doesn't matter who posted, if it's the husband or the wife, but the Facebook post where one of the people says, Happy 14, and 14 years to my spouse. I don't know how we've made it. There have been times that we were at each other's throat. There have been times that we were on the verge of divorce. There have been times that I just thought we would never survive this thing. But by God's grace, somehow we've made it this far. Hopefully we can make it another 14. And you just go, that's not a picture of Jesus. Is it? Is that, does that represent Jesus? Oh, man, you, you blew it a lot. You really screwed up by the skin of your teeth, you're still in God's grace. Hopefully you can make it another five years. Hopefully you can make it in God's grace another 10 years. Is that how God's grace works? Listen, if you think that God's grace is performance-based, we have a lot more important things to talk about. Because God's grace towards you is not performance-based. It is faith-based. Did you know that? God's grace towards you is his favor on you, his kindness on you, his mercy on you. When we don't deserve it, God's grace is poured on us and lavished on us. And, and, and he doesn't hold us guilty tomorrow for what we screwed up today. Now, if that's true, and it is, and I will preach that with my dying breath, There have been a lot of other things that I've had to change in my preaching through the years that were little theological nuances. But the cross of Christ and the grace of God, I will preach until I die. And and since it's true that God's grace is lavished on us so much so that he does not hold us wrong tomorrow for what we screwed up today, and since it's true that our marriages represent Jesus, there's no leeway for us to hold a grudge against our spouse tomorrow. There's no leeway for us to be unforgiving of them tomorrow. L- listen, what some Christian counseling would say is, um, it, well, I'll, I'll just tell you, if you come to me for Christian counseling, my, my first priority isn't going to ma- my first priority will not be to have the husband think more highly of his wife or have the wife think more highly of the husband. That won't be my first priority. 
my one and only priority is to have both of you think more highly of Jesus. Because as you think more highly of Jesus, what's going to be the result? Your marriage is going to be more beautiful. The reason that your marriage is suffering is because you're thinking lowly of Jesus, not because you're thinking lowly of each other. Think about it for a minute. Husband and wife come, they have marriage trouble, and we try to fix the perception the husband has of the wife and the wife has of the husband. Does that necessarily mean then that the couple leaves loving Jesus more? No. But if we can set your eyes rightly on Jesus, it does necessarily mean that the marriage becomes more whole. That's the purpose of it. Do you remember? In case you weren't here last week, the purpose of marriage, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God made a husband and wife for the purpose of imaging him. That's the goal of this. That's the aim of this, that we would image God. Not that, not that we would have our soulmate, not that we would have our best friend. Not, and those are great benefits, but that's not the aim of it. The aim of it's Christ. Please, please, please tell me that we can all agree that the salvation that comes through Jesus has a greater legacy in this earth than the marriage of Ryan and Michelle. Please agree that, that that's true, right? That at the end of the day, Ryan and Michelle have zero impact compared to the impact of Christ in eternity. Ryan and Michelle don't have any impact on eternity. Christ does. And if our marriages are about each other, we are thinking too lightly of Jesus. If our marriages are about each other, we're thinking too small about Jesus. Now, I would like to point out one other thing. This isn't uh, just about the part of your marriage that's visible. Anybody can look good at dinner for five minutes, right? Right? You know what I mean? Like you, you, can, you can go and say hi to your friends and anybody can look good. You can put on your best behavior for an hour or whatever, right? Does that make sense? Um, I, <laughs> my family growing up, my family looked good at church. We looked good at church. We were there every week. We looked good at church. My family was a train wreck at home. It was horrible. You didn't, you, I didn't want to live in my home. We looked good at church. We were terrible at home. Please understand that it's not how you look to everybody else for the hour that you're in front of them. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the heart. You're just a liar. You're just an actor. It's just a play. It's just pretend if you look good at church, but you look bad at home. If it's really about Jesus, it'll change at home and it'll change in public. I was a waiter at Chili's back in 97, uh, worked at Chili's for a year. And by the way, some people can't hold it together for even an hour at dinner. <laughs> Uh, my goodness, the things. It, it is amazing. Anybody else ever wait tables? It is amazing, isn't it? The things that you see and you're just like, oh my goodness, I, I think these people are probably going to kill each other when they leave here. Like it's just, it's, there, there are just times and you're just like, golly. Some of you have seen it as, you know, you've been at a restaurant and you, you're sitting next to that table and you're just like, oh my goodness, what is going on over there? When you're a waiter and you're, you're clearing a lot of tables in a night, you're there are just some people you're just like, wow, that is, that is just not a good situation. So not everybody can pretend really well, you know, but the goal isn't to pretend. The goal is to say this marriage is about Jesus, to be able to look at each other and say, God joined us together for the purpose of rightly proclaiming who he is. I forgive you not because you deserve it and not because I even have the power or the authority to forgive you. I forgive you because you're forgiven. Hear me say that. I forgive you because you're forgiven. By whom? By God. I love you because you're loved. Not by me, but by God. It, husbands, if you don't believe that God loves your wife more than you do, you're a fool. I promise you, God loves our wives more than we love our wives. I promise you that. The goal isn't for us to love our wives well. The goal is for us to show our wives how much they're loved by God. Does that make sense? 
Wives, I promise you that God loves your husband more than you do. I promise you that. The goal isn't to show your husband how much you love him. Father's Day is next Sunday, and like, I mean, I don't know. It, it's, anyway, I have thoughts about it. You can ask me Wednesday. But Father's Day is next Sunday, and now all of a sudden, you know, dad gets all these cards and fishing tackle, and everybody's like advertising, like everything on Facebook's like, Father's Day is this week. You know, buy him this new wallet or buy him this thing or whatever. That's fine, and you can do that, and you might do that because you really love them. I promise you this. I promise you that God loves your husband more than you do, and the goal isn't to be able to show your husband how much you love him. The goal is to correctly represent how much God loves him. Think about how we're shortchanging our spouse if the only thing we're trying to give them is our love instead of show them how deeply God loves them. My love pales in comparison to God's love for Michelle. My love for Michelle pales in comparison. It's not, pale is a stupid way to say it because like it doesn't even register. My love for Michelle doesn't even register compared to how much God loves Michelle. My goal isn't to be, to show her how much Ryan can love her. My goal is to represent how deeply God does love her. Does that make sense? This marriage has never been about you and your spouse, but has always been about Christ and the church, always. And the reason it's broken sometimes is because you've made it or I've made it about you and me. And until we make our marriages about Jesus, it will continue to be broken. It'll continue to limp along. It'll continue to hurt. It'll continue to cause us pain. I would encourage you strongly, whether you, you are already in this position or not, I would encourage you strongly, sometime today when you get a little bit of time, even if it's on the drive home from here, for some of you that's like, you know, a minute. You know, but for others of you, it'll take you a little bit of time. Maybe on the drive home from here, just say, hey, look, let's agree that our marriage is going to be about Jesus. And then decide, what does that mean for us? What does that need to change? I haven't been forgiving you like I should. I haven't been showing you the love of Jesus. Listen, Jesus loves you way better than I've been loving you, and I haven't been representing Jesus' love for you. I haven't shown you that you're not condemned. I've condemned you over and over, and God says you're uncondemned because of faith in him, and I haven't been showing you that. Make your marriage about proclaiming what is true, not from how you view your spouse, but from how God views your spouse. God views your spouse as loved. God views your spouse as adored, as a child of God, as holy, as sanctified, as uncondemned, as forgiven, as adopted, as brought into the kingdom of heaven. And until we view our spouses that way, we're shortchanging them. This is about Jesus, not us. And so let's make, let's, what is the application? Embrace every opportunity to have your marriage proclaim Jesus. Here's our prayer today. God, let our marriages rightly tell the redemption story. God, let our marriages rightly tell the redemption story. Let our marriages proclaim that we are uncondemned. Let our marriages proclaim that we are loved. Let our marriages proclaim that we are forgiven. Let our marriages proclaim that Jesus loves his bride. Take a moment, if you would, if you're here with your spouse, your future spouse, take a moment, if you would, and just pray that. Just pray that your marriage would represent Jesus well. Pray that for your kids, that they would grow up to have those kinds of marriages. And that Jesus would be rightly proclaimed.
God, we know that there have been times that our marriages haven't correctly reflected you. We know that there have been times that we've condemned one another. And yet before you, God, we are uncondemned. We know, God, that there have been times that we haven't forgiven each other, and yet we are tirelessly forgiven by you, endlessly forgiven by you. We know, God, that sometimes we have treated love like it's something that's earned or deserved, and yet the truth is that in you, God, we've never earned your love, we've never deserved it, and you've lavished on us anyway. We know, Lord, that there have been times that our preferences have mattered more than the gospel, We know that sometimes, Lord, our grudges have carried more weight than your grace. And we know, Lord, that as the world has looked on and as our kids have looked on, as our grandkids have looked on, that many times our marriage has not represented well the truth of who Jesus is. And we ask, God, that that would end today. that from this moment forward, from this day forward, that our marriages would rightly and beautifully tell the story of redemption. That our marriages would be filled with the measure of your grace, the abundance of your love, free from condemnation, free from judgment, free from pain, and Lord, filled with richness. And that the world would marvel at it And at the end of the day, Lord, not that the world would praise us or praise our marriages, but God, that all praise and all glory and all honor would fall at the feet of Jesus Christ. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray these things. Amen.